Today is Juneteenth. Juneteenth is a holiday which commemorates the abolition of slavery on June 19th, 1865. And for the first time in 12 years, Congress is having a hearing about reparations. Massive crowds turning out for the debate today. The conversation has been gaining new attention from Democrats ahead of 2020, but Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says even researching what could be done, he says it's not a good idea. We've, you know, tried to deal with our original sin of slavery by fighting a civil war, by passing uh, landmark civil rights legislation. Uh, we've elected an African-American president. I, I think we're always a work in progress in this country, uh, but n no one currently alive was responsible for that. The tone of the room serious, but quite contentious. And the real dilemma posed by reparations is just that, a dilemma of inheritance. It is impossible to imagine America without the inheritance of slavery. As historian Ed Baptist has written, enslavement, quote, shaped every crucial aspect of the economy and politics of America, so that by 1836, more than 600 million, or almost half of the economic activity in the United States derived directly or indirectly from the cotton produced by the million odd slaves. There are serious questions about this from, from all sides of the political spectrum, and they're honest and sincere questions that we want to address. But putting aside the injustice of monetary reparations from current taxpayers for the sins of a small subset of Americans from many generations ago, the, let me finish. The, the fair distribution of reparations would be nearly impossible once one considers the complexity of the American struggle to abolish slavery. We have an obligation to acknowledge that any monetary reparations that might be recommended by the commission created by H.R. 40 would almost certainly be unconstitutional on their face. The reason for that, listen, wait a minute. The, the reason for that is a legal question. See, the legal question is the federal government can't constitutionally provide compensation today to a specific racial group because other members of that group, maybe several generations ago, were discriminated against and treated inhumanely. I sit here as the great-grandson of a former slave, Mary Brown, who was freed by the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. I had the fortune of meeting her as a small child. H.R. 40 is in fact, is in fact the response of the United States of America long overdue. Slavery is the original sin. Slavery has never received an apology. I just simply ask, why not? And why not now? My next guest shared his own personal connections to slavery, a quilt made by his great grandmother. We'll get him to, to talk about that. Cornell Brooks is the former president and CEO of the NAACP. He's also a civil rights attorney. So, Cornell, a pleasure, sir, of course, to, to have you back on. And before we get into the quilt, I just have mm -hmm. to get your reaction to the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and his comments. Uh, his his, his car comments really. Uh, reflect a kind of uh, uh, ignorance and arrogance. To simply say that we can't have a discussion about reparations for slavery because slavery occurred so long ago uh, ignores the fact that slavery lasted for at least 250 years. It gave rise to Jim Crow, uh, the Black Codes, uh, the new Jim Crow of mass incarceration, and the voter suppression which was conceived as a vestige of slavery post-reconstruction continues today perpetuated by his party and so no I was just gonna say so I mean it's not just Mitch McConnell I mean obviously who right. who, who thinks that a lot of privileged folks would you mm -hmm. know retreat to the argument well I wasn't alive so why should I why should I pay for that and so that that is that is your response can, can, can you tie it tie it into the to the quilt for me and why why is that so special for you sure so my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, the Reverend Pompey Lavalley, was born and enslaved as a child, as a boy. Uh, his, I should say, my great-grandmother made a quilt from his britches. My grandmother mm. gave the quilt to me. I slept under it as a boy. There it the is. You've got it right, right now. 
That's right. Look at the that. The vestiges of slavery continue today in the form Look of mass that. incarceration, segregation. And so when I think of my great-great-grandfather's quilt, mm. I think about this being wrapped around his body and the body and the brilliance of black people that were commodified to the tune of trillions. The fact of the matter is we need to have this conversation. We cannot make uh, the moral case disappear as though it were invisible, and we cannot act as though the mathematical case, or the economic case, if you will, is impossible. Let me ask it can't you about be the done, mathematical. we should be. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about the mathematical case, and, and thank you so much for bringing that quilt. Um, it's incredibly special. Uh, this is, is what Senator Cory Booker argues. He, he says he says it's not just about direct payments. The wealth gap between white and black Americans is incredibly stark. When you look at the numbers, this is according to the Federal Reserve, the median right. wealth for uh, white households in 2016, $171,000 for black households, right. $17,600. Just That's right. Let's keep those numbers up on the screen just for people to, to digest that. Now, now this committee hearing today, it's not to, to make any sort of decision That's on right. reparations. It's, it's about a committee to explore what can be done about the inequities that still exist. What do you hope comes out of this? What I hope is that we have a conversation such that we understand that the moral case for reparation is clear and compelling. That is to say, slavery existed over the course of centuries and was perpetuated into the last century and certainly into this century uh, in terms of segregation, uh, in terms of the African-American community literally having its wealth extracted from it, uh, in terms of the foreclosure crisis, in terms of contract uh, purchases of homes, uh, segregation in the labor market. We have to have a conversation about the morality behind reparations, but also the math, that there's a compelling economic uh, argument and it's simply a matter of us having the moral will to have this conversation at this time. But let's be clear, we can't get to reparations until we have serious, thoughtful discussions about reparations. And that it needs to involve the whole of the country. And so it's not right for uh, Mitch McConnell to simply say we can't talk about it because he doesn't see it and doesn't understand it. And I believe most Americans are willing to have this conversation and know we need to have this conversation. 2020 candidates having the conversation. And I wanted to ask you about another issue on 2020. Sure. I was just talking to our correspondent, Rebecca Buck. So Senator Biden uh, was behind, was you know, speaking at this fundraiser. Was you know, His point was he was trying to say, hey, I can work across the aisle. I can work with Republicans. And he was speaking specifically about the segregationist senator. Um, and to hear the, the Cory Booker's camp his word, he's pissed. He's pissed over this. And we haven't heard anything since from Joe Biden. But what do you make about the former vice president's comments about working with segregationists? Is I'm, that a problem? I'm, I'm, I'm frankly perplexed because he, uh, Vice President Biden suggests because a segregationist referred to him as son, as a white man, as opposed to referring to black men as boys, Boy. that this is, this is a mark of civility between two senators, when in fact it's simply one white senator according a modicum of respect to another white senator. Uh, that is not the full measure of civility. Civility would be for someone like that to work with uh, people who uh, that he uh, segregated, uh, that he discriminated against, that he spoke ill of. Uh, and so I frankly don't understand the point that the vice president was making, but more to the point, you can't make fun of, or I should say make light of, uh, African-American men being dismissed, uh, morally speaking, uh, as boys. Uh, that, that's just not appropriate. And I do think the vice president should really uh, take responsibility for this, apologize, and uh, get, get back to the substance of, of the campaign.